Real quick, before we start this podcast episode, I just want to say thank you for tuning into the Mark Olson Podcast. I know you've got a million things that you could be doing right now, and the fact that you're taking time out of your day to watch this podcast episode truly means the world to me, and I just want to say thank you for that. If you'd like to continue to support the podcast, right below this video, if you could hit the subscribe button, and then hey, if you got some more time and you want to hit the download button, the comment button, the like button, the share button, any of those buttons, it's greatly, greatly appreciated. It helps for other people to find out about the podcast, and it helps for you to be notified about future episodes. So if you guys could take a quick second, hit the subscribe button, I would really appreciate that. Outside of that, this episode and every other episode is brought to you guys by Roast Umber Coffee. As some of you guys know, I co-founded Roast Umber Coffee, and we have the greatest farmers in Guatemala and Honduras and the greatest roaster in Grand Rapids, Michigan, all to bring you guys the greatest cup of coffee possible. So if you'd like to try it out, go to our website, use the coupon code MARK30, and you're going to get 30% off your coffee. Now on to the episode. Thank you guys again for tuning in. Welcome to the Mark Colson Podcast. All right, man. First off, I just want to say thank you for coming out here. I know you had a little bit of a journey uh, to get out here. We connected a few months ago, and we finally made it happen. So uh, yeah. thank you for coming onto the podcast. Thanks for having me. Uh, no problem at all. So uh, let's start off with just kind of who you are and a little bit about yourself. Yeah, sure. So my name is Tim, and I'm originally from Russia. So I came to the US like about three years ago. And, you know, I worked in consulting and in financial services. And, yeah, I have like a background in quant finance and I also have like a bachelor's in economics and yes, we kind of started Generous Robots about like five months ago in December and February. And I kind of, you know, used that background with the whole like conception of Generous Robots and kind of tried to implement, you know, my, my skills into, into that project. Very cool. Very cool. And I got to give a shout out real quick to your community because I'm pretty sure it was either when I was reaching a uh, like certain amount of followers on Twitter or it was when I was hitting a thousand subscribers on YouTube. <laughs> but the uh, the Generous Robots gang just all came out uh, right and click clank all over my stuff and they got me to that next benchmark. And then today again, they got me to 2000 subscribers on YouTube. So really? I, yeah. So I got to give ah, a shout yeah. out to your community. They're definitely a very loyal group of people. And uh, when they raid something, they really raid the fuck out of it so yeah of course yeah and so i got to give them credit for that because not everybody goes that hard so mm -hmm. um yeah so first off shout outs to your community second the other thing i want to announce uh and we'll talk about it uh, a little bit more whatever we'll have more details by the time this comes out is that we're going to be doing some sort of giveaway we're still figuring out what that is so if you're watching this right now if you post this li to the link to this on youtube or on or on twitter um if you meme the podcast if you do any sort of creative if you you know, create a thread talking about what we talked about or, you know, whatever you want to do with this. If you do something cool with it, uh, we're going to be doing a giveaway via Hey Wallet. We're not really sure what that is yet. All the details will be out by the time this podcast comes out, but just check Twitter. We'll announce it. Uh, but yeah, have some fun with this. Share it. Um, like, comment, subscribe, the whole nine yards. We're going to be looking at and seeing what people are doing. And then we're going to reward people who are, uh, you know, sharing the hell out of the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's a great idea. And to your point about kind of, you know, our Twitter rates and like the whole activity. So we worked on that a little bit. So we have been inspired, you know, by the rates of OK Bears and of the cats on crack. And we kind of realized that we have to work on that as well. And so uh, we have implemented the rate bot on our Discord that it actually has a leaderboard. It, it, uh, it kind of automates the whole, you know, rate process. So it keeps tracks of all your tweets, likes and retweets. And we actually have a leaderboard. So like every week, you know, we reward like top five or 10 projects in this leaderboard. And I think that that's kind of a great way to automate, like to automate and to keep track of your loyal community. A hundred percent. And I, I actually think that's something about the podcast too, that I always tell people like, you can literally look on YouTube and see which uh, videos have the most, you know, uh, likes, the most comments, the most views, everything like that. And that tells you a lot about that community, because if they're the, the project that is spending the most time hitting the like button, subscribing, commenting, if they're watching the podcast, if they're watching the entire podcast, that says a lot about the community and things like that. So I think there's a lot that you can gain from that. And, uh, you know, and we were talking about this a little bit before we started the podcast, but that was one of the things with D-Guides is that even before the floor price is where it is now, um, the community was just super, super loyal. And so that's one of the things that I look for to see if I want to ape into a project is like, is there really a community and how loyal are they? And do they actually give a shit about when somebody puts out like a Twitter poll? Do they really try to make sure that they win that Twitter poll? Do they, you know, are they super engaging with, you know, tweets and everything? 
everything like that. And so that has definitely been something I've seen with Generous Robots that you guys do a yeah. damn good job of that. So shout out to you guys. Thank you. And I guess that's why the popularity of these 10K collections have increased recently because people want to onboard uh, like as many, you know, community members as possible. So basically participate in those rates and, you know, to be as active as possible. So essentially it's important not to have uh, like many whales in your projects because like the, once again, the fewer p people you have, like the less, you know, rate power you have and the less kind of PFPs are there on Twitter. So it's really important to have like a really, really like uh, large community. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about that. And it's been interesting to see how kind of like the meta has changed with uh, different, you know, mint sizes and project sizes and whatnot uh, ever since uh, the beginning of basically like all of us getting into Solana NFTs in, in the fall of last year. Uh, but we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. But I want to get back into Generous Robots. And so mm -hmm. uh, before you got into starting the project and everything like that, you talked a little bit a second ago about your background. Um, kind of what got you into NFTs, you know, kind of being like mathematic based. I mean, it seems like all oh, your entire background is all math. <laughs> Um, you're probably yeah. one of the one of the few of us who's just incredible at math. So I know I struggle with that sometimes. So maybe <laughs> maybe I'm just speaking for myself here. But uh, in terms of what was your background, what got you into NFTs? Yeah. So once again, like I have a quant finance background, so and also economics as well. So lo lots of math. And we actually started this project with my childhood friend. It's uh, like his nick is Priber, and his real name is Alex. So I kind of you know realized that uh, we initially we like decided to trade options and you know we had different strategies i don't know if you guys you know know anything about options but there is like one strategy covered a uh, poor man's covered call and like we you know got like five or ten k from that but yeah it's not that important but after that we kind of you know jumped on the hype train of nfts and we started with Solana because it has like a low barrier to entry and you know lower gas fees obviously and uh, I don't know if you guys uh, like remember this project, the Rogue Sharks. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I uh, so they had like this lottery system where you had to you know uh, like basically create a ticket and uh, y you could have won the NFT or you could have not won the NFT. And we had like about ten. We created ten wallets and we like basically won like three or f five NFTs. And from that, we made like about 5K or something like that. So that was kind of a turning point. That was the time when Solana was like 250 or something like that. So yeah, we've made like really kind of a lot of money from that. And we realized, you know, that it's a great also tech, like trading opportunity. And at the same time, we were also really, you know, engaged with DeFi. And we had like a mini VC fund with our friend. So like there have been, you know, three, three of us. So where we've actually, you know, participated in this initial DEX offering projects that, you know, I will talk about a little bit later. And we also, you know, based on the crypto boom and like the crypto bull market, we've managed to, you know, make some profits in that direction. And yeah, that's how basically I got into the NFTs. So it was somewhere, you know, in August or uh, September. There we go. There we go. Yeah, it's always interesting to me, like how each person got their little entry into into yeah. NFTs because it's such a such a you know crazy world and everything like that. But um, you know where it was popularity wise back then versus now is completely different. And so it's always interesting to me, kind of what somebody's you know initial push was into it. And so for you, you know, coming in from more of like the trading background and then getting into it, and uh, so you were you know straight DGen mode right from the jump, which uh, you know I love to hear. So that's uh, always. Yeah, I wouldn't say it was a digital mode. It, it was more for like a trading opportunity for, for like me and for Priber. So like Priber has more of a technical background. So I have more like a mathematical and trading background. So, you know, it was like a combination of our skills and we tried to kind of utilize them. See, I would call you a smart DJ then because <laughs> I, I look at it as anytime you're into this sort of stuff, like there's still, no matter how good you are at the mathematics and everything like that, there's still an element of like gambling, right? Because there's always a chance that it doesn't go over well, right? If you nail it, then you can make a shit ton of money. But obviously there's also, especially if people get into like leverage trading and things like that, there's a, a lot of ways that you can lose a lot of money, right? Yeah. So I look at it as anytime you kind of have the, uh, the, you know, for lack of better words, the balls to get into some of that, you got to be a little bit of a degen because it's uh it's so much easier to just like put money in traditional stocks and just kind of let that sit there and not really do much but when you're uh when you're trading and things like that um hey i think that's a uh you know a smart degen uh but a degen regardless in terms of just kind of having fun with the trading and and everything like that and obviously you guys you know have the technical background and whatnot uh far far superior than i do because i i'm the technical side of things i get lost a lot of times but um, so getting back into, into, uh, generous robots here. So how did you guys end up coming up with the idea of generous robots? So, yeah, as I've mentioned before, you know, we had this, you know, mini VC fund with our friends and we kind of realized that, you know, if we consolidate capital, we can get higher allocation on the ideal launch pads. 
So let me kind of get a little bit deeper into that. So essentially, IDO is initial DAX offering. So what does it mean? So it's like similar to the ICOs, so initial coin offerings, but uh, it's happening on the decentralized exchange. So you don't have the possibility of getting scammed by the like centralized exchange in that case and by the projects. Uh, and uh, basically, you know, we had this idea that if we created the project and consol consolidated the funds of, you know, our potential minters or holders, we will be able to, you know, become sort of a whale on these launch pads and get higher allocation, meaning higher investment opportunities, and then redistri redistribute all the profits among our holders. So that was like a bread and butter and, you know, the main idea behind the project. And was, were you ever worried about, because um, wasn't it a lot of times people worried about their project being considered like a security then? Yeah, that's actually a kind of great question. So at that time, we did not have that concern because, you know, Solana was not where, you know, it was today. There was no Solana summer, obviously. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we actually kind of tried to, you know, research this topic. And I, I don't know if you guys uh, like heard about this project, Meerkat. Like I, Mere, yeah, Mere I was in that from, from Mint Day. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And they openly advertised that they're going to re redistribute royalties, you know, to their holders. And uh, that's why they got delisted from Magic Eden. And they had to hire like a lawyer to create like a 10 page uh, white paper or whatever, explaining why they're not a security and like try, trying to, you know, prove it by kind of taking all the points from the Howey test. And uh, yeah, so essentially we tried to, you know, get that consulting as well. And that's also, you know, the reason why we decided to like create our own token. So, you know, ha have like this idea that our token does not provide any monetary value. But at the same time, we, you know, are able to like sponsor the liquidity of the token with, uh, you know, with the idea of profits. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that was a really interesting time period because I remember when the Meerkats came out and they initially, I think they went up to like a 30 floor. Yeah. Uh, they were doing really, really well. And I remember my first like royalty payment was like two soul when <laughs> soul was like $250. Right. And so I was like, this is great. This is, this is amazing. And then I want to say it was like, a week later, two weeks later, that it was like, yeah, actually, uh, this whole securities thing, and that became a major deal, and then the floor obviously uh, tanked for Meerkats after that, and so, and that was back at a time when I feel like every project was coming out and saying, like, hey, we're gonna give you a percentage of royalties back, you know, or whatever, and so that was that was kind of um, you know propping up the floor of a lot of different projects, and then since then, you know, then the you know everybody started talking about securities and whatnot. Now no one really talks about kind of running something like that because there's uh, too much uh, nerve about, you know, technically being considered security or whatever. Uh, but it's interesting to see how like the the community and the NFT space in general, like changes as people, you know, as like projects go from this is the thing that's working. Like right now we're in the big like brand, you know, play like everybody. We're going to be a brand right back then. It was like, we're going to make you a lot of money by giving you a percentage back of all the royalties, yeah. yada, yada. And then it's, it's interesting to me, like, what will be the next thing? Because, you know, you never know what that is. Uh, but there's always going to be the next thing because we play each thing kind of into the dirt and then the next meta kind of builds up from there. Yeah, the meta obviously has, you know, shifted from the time we've launched. So before, like, we've launched the top projects. And, I mean, they're still today the top projects, but they were, like, Baroico Dragons, the Thai Robotics, the Mindfog. I don't know if you guys mm -hmm. still remember them. They're, oh, yeah. like, in a pretty kind of bad state right now. But with all due respect, I love Mindfox. But yeah, so the, this passive income place were like the best kind of projects. And, you know, we were there as well. But then, you know, OK Bears completely changed, you know, the paradigm of, of Solana. And, uh, you know, all the like projects had to adjust to this new meta, you know, the 10K collection, great art, you know, we're building the brand, we're the brand. So uh, that's also, you know, something that we're trying to do right now. We're trying like to build into that direction. You know, we have this uh, art upgrades for generous robots. And we are trying to make like our art more PFP friendly because when we started the project, like we, you know, thought about the utilities and about like this in investment thesis much more. And we didn't really care, you know, about the art. So it was not like terrible, but it's not, you know, something on the current like DGUTS level or once again, okay, Bears level. But yeah, at the same time, you know, we've talked a bit, uh, talked about it a bit. So I kind of realized that in order to get your, you know, project into the mass adoption phase, you need to, have a beautiful art and you know yeah that's something we are working on right now
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's really interesting to see more and more projects kind of going back and saying, hey, we need to change something with our art to make it more uh, where it pops, you know, and I think we're seeing that with a lot of different projects is that I think people as like more and more time goes on, different projects come out and you look at certain art and I'm not saying this at all about generous robots because I would not call this for you guys, but there's some projects and I'm not going to name where you look at it and you're like, your art looks lazy, right? Like the layers are all kind of fucked up and, and things like that. And so back then or back like, you know, a few months ago, people kind of would just like move past that whatever now we're more like because we see a lot of projects that come out with this beautiful art right and and you're like okay I, I can tell how much work went into that right the level of details crazy everything like that and so I think people now appreciate that aspect more than we used to um and so you know once again it'll be interesting to see what the next meta is um but you know at the same time if you're uh, continually like if your project is crushing all of it you know if you've got the utility you got the community you've got the the uh the branding and everything like that you've got the art all of that then your project's going to do damn well no matter what the next round of meta is and so i think you know i look for with a project is do they try to be the best product possible or are they just like hey we're this way and that's all we're ever going to be whatever and i think now we're starting to see more projects that are like we're willing to adapt and i think that's an important aspect of the nft space is uh people being willing to adapt yeah absolutely and i think that's even right now, the meta is also shifting and changing. So uh, right now, the you know 10, 10k collection with the great art and you know advertising that they're building the brand, they're not that popular right now. So I think that in this market, with when you know there is not enough liquidity, the free mints have become like increasingly popular. And you know we're talking once again about the goblins, and I think that there have also been one project on Ethereum which actually paid its minters like 0.1 Ethereum. Oh wow! Yeah, I think like fuck you or something like that. So it's uh, yeah. And I think that that's essentially why, you know, they, they're booming. So there is a project on Solana, uh, Ghost Kid. Like yeah. Ghost oh, yeah. Kid, yeah. And, like, these guys, they have a, had a really, really, like, cheap mint, and they've managed to, like, build their community basically from that. Because, like, they mainly have no expectations because, like, they have a really, really, like, small mint funds. But at the same time, uh, they kind of realize it's, if people like, you know, the idea, they will be able to get, like, more funds from royalties. And that's how, you know, it essentially works in this bear market. You won't be able to, like, attract lots of funds, you know, from the mint sales. It's yeah. more about, like, your kind of credibility and it's more about royalties right now. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I, I always look at it like I understand when projects are looking for a certain amount of mint funds so that they can operate their business and everything like that. But if you bring enough utility to your project, if you make it where it's a coveted project in the space, you're going to make plenty off royalties. And that's not to say like don't, you know, have a, you know, if, if there's a certain mint price that you feel like your project is worth, then by all means, go for it. But also the community, then we need to also say if, if we don't believe that a project's price is worth it stop minting it damn it like don't just like sometimes i feel like we see people bitch on twitter about a mint price and then they just go and mint it and i'm like so you bitched about nothing then so <laughs> if you don't like the mint price if you don't like something about it then voice your displeasure by not minting not by like saying i don't like this but i'm still gonna mint you know yeah. that's how we improve is by saying there's certain levels of expectations that we have and there's certain things that during a bear market we want to see projects shift to this or shift to that or whatever and i'm not saying one thought process on it is wrong right versus wrong or whatever. It's just more of like, if there's a, if you think to yourself, I don't think that project is worth that mint price, then don't buy it. But the problem is that, you know, the community and, I mean, the Solana community is almost like a prisoner of the situation because they feel obligated to mint because of the FOMO and, you know, they, they're they just afraid that, you know, they're going to like miss it. And especially it comes to the whitelist mints. So, you know, this new meta that like there is a 10K collection and like 9, 9K whitelist spots. So essentially, it's not that maybe complicated to get these whitelist spots. And if you have the whitelist spots, you kind of realize that, okay, you know, I'm in a better position than everyone else. I can mint it and maybe get some profits. So I think that that's also something psychological. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's there's so many different uh, kind of psychological uh, factors that you have to you have to play into this <clears throat> when you're trying to figure out like, what to mint, what not to mint, what to buy on the aftermarket, what not to buy. I mean, there's a lot of different ways and, it, and it's constantly changing. And so I think it's just something that we always have to be uh, willing to adapt in the space, whether as a buyer or whether as a project uh, holder or project founder or whatever. And so um, with that said, I mean, talking about kind of changing up your plans and things like that, um, how was that for you guys kind of deciding, okay, this this uh, IDO aspect of things, uh, w what would you say? It was not working? How would you describe that? So it was actually working you know, quite good in the first two months when there was a like bull market.
because you know we went like 2x or 3x from our investments. So I would say that you know it's a re- really great concept, but unfortunately it works only in the bull market. When there is a bear market, you know the projects they are not launching, so you don't have the opportunity to basically to allocate your capital in there. So you that's why you have to have like some other you know income stream so utilities for your token. And that's partially the reason why we decided, you know, to open up this launch pad and to kind of, you know, have other utilities besides that. So th- there is like uh, one common utility for all the NFT projects right now, the raffles and auctions. And yeah, we'll, you know, touch on that a bit later, you know, w- with the whole whitelist for DAPIs and stuff like that. But uh, it's essential for, you know, for the founders to like adjust, you know, according to the market conditions and to always make sure that, you know, your holders are safe, that your business is diversified. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think everybody has to be willing to pivot because at the end of the day, you know, you can say, well, hey, this worked for our project two months ago. But obviously, if that shifts and it's no longer working, it's like, what other choice do you have except to adapt? And, and, you know, because it's kind of that whole adapt or die uh, mindset of like this project, this space moves so damn quick that you have to be willing to adapt and you have to do that quickly Mm -hmm. and, and urgently because there's so many projects that are moving at such rapid speeds right and that's when it comes down to it's important to have that right team around you uh to have that ability to adapt quickly and figure out how to make it work in different market conditions and things like that and uh you know and we're seeing that now where the projects that are able to make it through this bear market are going to be killing it when we're in the next bull market but you have to be able to make it through this and, and i think that's the ability to adapt which you guys are realizing okay we have to do that right the idos kill it during the bull uh bull market but during the bear market not so much okay we need to pivot on that and then figuring out from there what that what that pivot actually looks like and then having the community that's then going to support that pivot, right? So if you have a loyal community that says, hey, we're willing to trust that this is the right way, then then you have a, a, a more likely chance of succeeding in that, right? If you're having to fight mm-hmm. against your community and, and it's, you know, it's bickering back and forth, obviously your project floor is probably just going to get dumped as a result of that. So it's the ability to like be transparent and talk to your community about why we're making the changes that we're making, but we're doing that for the greater good of the, of the project, of the community and everything like that because we want this to succeed. And when you have that kind of um, that uh, good relationship there, it just makes it that much more likely that you guys are going to succeed. It's also crucial to provide your community with a detailed explanation of why you are changing, you know, your kind of idea and your roadmap. Because, you know, initially when we wanted to kind of uh, shift from this idea concept, some of our members, they were not so happy about it because they were like, why are you changing your roadmap? I, you know, I bought into this project because I wanted to, you know, have this idea of profit and stuff like that. But essentially, when we try to, you know, be vocal about it and when we try to explain our community, okay, guys, you know, it's not working right now and, you know, we need to maintain the project. We need to kind of, you know, support it and that's why, you know, we're basically doing it. Yeah, I mean, that's what you you have to do it that way. And it goes back to the transparency side of things. Uh, people will respect that. And, you know, I think it's important for project founders to try to put themselves in the in the minds and the in the bodies of the holders and then for holders to put themselves in the project founders minds and, and kind of realize like you're you're working on the same team, but you have different viewpoints. Right. And so you have to try to understand each other's viewpoint, but then you have to be transparent enough to try to explain to each other why you think the way that you do. And I think that's one of the things that we've seen with the projects that have done really, really well is they've, they've, they have a really, really good relationship with their holders where they're able to listen to their holders and then kind of adapt as to, okay, hey, our holders are suggesting that we do this. We agree with this aspect. Maybe we don't agree with this aspect or whatever, but it eventually becomes a, um, like a melting pot of ideas. And then the right ideas rise to the top and those take the, those ideas take that project to the next level. Mm -hmm. And so it's finding that good relationship between like trusting your gut as a founder, but then also being able to listen to your community and kind of say to yourself, okay, they, they like it when we do this, why they don't like it when we do this, why? And then having individual conversations sometimes with some of those, uh, you know, to be honest, I think we should hear more. I don't know. I don't think we hear enough about like every once in a while project founder, just calling a holder on discord. Like (laughs) I honestly think that should happen from time to time and just like gauge the interest and gauge the feeling of your holders. And you know, it, it takes, if you, if you said to yourself, I'm going to take an hour and call 20 different holders, you know, for a five minute conversation, whatever, they would love that shit. 
they would love that shit, you know? And it's like, it's not like you have to have like a super technical conversation with each of them. You could just literally be like, hey man, how's your day going? You know? Yeah. And that's the sort of shit that like people, there's not that much of a difference between you as a project founder and me as a holder, right? So the more conversation you have, the more you, you start to understand why you're doing the things that you're doing, why they see things the way they do. And then you're able to come up with the best ideas possible that's going to take your project to the, you know, to the levels that you want to go to. Yeah. And I also kind of wanted to add that every, you know, big decision that's happening uh, with our project is uh, approved by our DAO. So we have like an official system where we have a, like a weighted pulse where, you know, basically uh, the more NFTs you own, the higher your weight. And uh, so, for example, we recently had a proposal for halving of the gear. And initially we did not plan to do that. We had the, like the DK coefficient. So essentially that's, you know, the same thing as halving, but it happens like, you know, within the time. So it's not that drastical. And I think that I liked it much more because, you know, the holders, they did not have, you know, this certain cut in their, you know, shares or revenues. And yeah, that's why we kind of wanted to implement that. But, you know, when the Solana went from like 120 to like 30, we kind of realized, okay, guys, we were not able to like maintain the gear price. And that's why we kind of have to do something. So we proposed this decision and it was approved by the majority, like 70 to 30 percent. So, you know, people were still kind of unhappy that, you know, they were not able to, you know, get as much gear as they would have wanted. But uh, essentially, you know, we had no other choice. If we did not like implement that halving, the gear price would have tanked even more. So, you know, it's important to, you know, make these decisions and adjustments once again. And if, and if I were you and I don't want to tell anybody how to do their job, but it would help if let's say there's somebody on Twitter who's, who's complaining about, you know, Hey, I don't like that they did this, yada, yada, yada call that person, you know, like that sort of stuff would go such a long way. And I know you're busy as hell. So I know it's like, when I say to you, well, just take an hour and do that. You're probably sitting there like, dude, an hour, like you're asking me to find an hour in my schedule. It would be, it would be worth it because then it's always that whole thing that I don't know what the exact saying is, but it's like good news travels or uh, bad news travels faster than yeah. good news, but also like really good customer service goes like a really long way. Cause you're way more, you're super likely to go and tell people when you have like really, really, really good customer service. Right. So if somebody gets a phone call from you, odds are they're going to go directly to Twitter and be like, I just had a great conversation with Tim from Generous Robots. And like, I'm really bullish on, you know, where this is heading. And now I understand why uh, they're doing what they're doing. Or even if they still disagree, they can be like, he took the time out of his day to explain the, the rationale and thought behind it. And like, I appreciate that. And that's the way to build really, really ironclad uh, community because at that point they, they get you, you know, as a, as a person. And so I think that's actually, you know, going back to Frank, I was just a random holder when I reached out to him to come onto the podcast. It wasn't like I was, you know, well known in the NFT space. I think I had like 2000 followers on Twitter and like, you know, whatever, and my nothing on, on YouTube at all. And then, uh, you know, and Frank was willing to take a chance and come out here and, and, you know, and have the conversation and everything like that. And, you know, and that was him taking time out of his busy ass day to go and do that. Right. But so many people loved and appreciated that. Right. So I think, you know, and we talked about this a little bit before we started the podcast, but it's like that, that transparency and that trust that you build with your community goes such a long way because this market is so fresh and so new that like, it's not like we can say, oh, Generous Robots has been around for five years. Right. It's like, no, the NFT space hasn't been around for five years. Right. So we got to do more things to build that sort of trust with our community and everything like that so that we can survive these bear markets because there's no real history of any of us uh, like um, succeeding out of these, right? So we have to build those success stories and that's going to come from having a super, super loyal community who feels connected to Tim and feels connected to everybody else who's a part of Generous Robots. And then when you have that, then you've got that just super, super uh, bullish community who's going to who's going to live and die for Generous Robots. Mm -hmm. I think that it's not about having, you know, kind of calls with individual holders, but maybe having like an AMAs. So I think that we try to have like at least one or two AMA like per like two weeks, not like that. And maybe like the more AMAs you have, like the better you do. And that's why probably, you know, D guts are doing so great as well, because once again, like Frank is very eloquent, he's very vocal and he like addresses all of the concerns. So for example, like yesterday, I mean, not yesterday, I don't know when this podcast is going to like be released, but yeah. like they recently had this, uh, you know, Dapis uh, Twitter hack. And like he recently, you know, had an AMA regarding that saying, okay, guys, like we don't know how to kind of, uh, have the ownership of the Twitter account back, but, you know, we're trying to do everything possible. So, yeah, it's important to kind of, you know, assure your community that you're working, you know, on, on improvements or updates and that you're actually doing something. Yeah, and I think, obviously, I, I, I think there's a, there's a time and place for AMAs. I think AMAs are great. I do think there's a level of 
lack of personal connection where he's not talking to you directly. He's talking to the mass audience. I would say this. I think there's a time and place for when it makes sense to actually contact an individual holder. And that's to me, if I saw, if let's, let's use myself as an example. If I saw somebody dogging the Mark Holzer podcast, if they were like, this shit is trash, right? Um, or even, even a few weeks ago, there was an episode that I put out and somebody was like, you talk too much in this one. But, you know, I, I was editing it and I was like, yeah, I agree with you. Like, I, I definitely was talking too much on that. I was a little cracked out on coffee. I talked too much or whatever. When I responded back and said that, he he understood and, and you know, and we had a good conversation about it, right? Mm-hmm. So if somebody were to come out and say, I strongly disagree with generous robots on that, I think that would be a time where it would yeah. be like, hey, you know what? A personal phone call might go a long way to kind of help calm some of the FUD and everything like that. Because as you know, it's like when people start, you know, when you start kind of having like a little crack in the foundation that crack can turn into a massive mm-hmm. hole right because like usually people fought not because you know they hate you i know like they hate your project but because they just don't know something mm-hmm. they don't have like the same amount of information that you have and that's why you you know you kind of want to explain them you know as detailed as possible that okay like what's the rationale behind this decision so i recently put out you know once again the twitter thread like why we've decided you know to like <laughs> purchase you know dust with like 60k from our treasury and, you know, we got, like, some hate, you know, from, like, the top communities on Solana that, okay, guys, you you don't know how to use, you know, your treasury and stuff like that. But essentially, I tried to, you know, break it down, like, each point that it makes sense mathematically. It's, it makes sense, like, from the marketing standpoint. And it makes sense, you know, from the, like, leveraging the DGOTS, like, power in community. So I don't know why should we not do that. And after that, I think, like, everyone, you know, clapped me in the comments or whatever. And everyone was quite satisfied, you know, with my re- reply. So essentially, that's the main reason why you should be, you know, as vocal as possible. And I also think that, like, all the, like, kind of important updates and use right now, you should release them on Twitter, not on Discord as well. Because Discord is only close to your community. And you have to, like, explain to the other communities also the rationale behind your decision. So this way you can attract new potential investors. So, yeah, that's also, you know, something that we are working on. Yeah, and I I firmly agree with uh, uh, putting out big announcements on Twitter because one, I think more people outside of your community see those and they're more likely to join into your community if they understand why you're making the decisions that they're making. And then also Discord, I'm sorry for if anybody's associated with, if they work with Discord, this is the shittiest platform I've ever used in my life. The amount of bots on there, the amount of like notifications are in a disastrous (laughs) position. I can't even open the damn app on my phone because I can't even click anything on the top because there's just notifications coming nonstop. And then somebody will respond, well, you can move notification. Dude, it shouldn't be that difficult. Like, it is a god-awful platform. I hate Discord. So I hope there's, like, a a day we stop using Discord because I despise that app with a burning passion. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I (laughs) partially agree that it's a very technical platform. And I think that I've spent, like, one or two days just trying to understand how, like, one of the Discord bots are working. And yeah, it's like, it was very annoying and frustrating. But at the same time, you know, Discord has a lot of technical cap- capabilities. Once again, you can like keep track of your like community engagement and stuff like that. So I think that right now, you know, the combination of Twitter and Discord like works, works the best. But I do th- agree with you that Discord sucks in terms of the like uh, engagement with other communities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's no real way to associate with other communities on there. And then, yeah, and and obviously there's great uses of Discord. Like, I love the announcements and everything like that. And I think that works great through there and all of that. But, man, the amount of, like, spam and bullshit on there, I'm like, dude, can yeah. we just clean this up a little bit? Because uh, it is, I mean, even, like, I went through once and just cleaned out all of, like, my, my messages. And then on, on my desktop, and then I go to my phone, and they're all still there. And I was like, dude, I got to do it again? <laughs> like, I'm going to lose my mind here. So, man, like, I have, like, about, I know, like, 50 uh, communities on Discord and like probably like 200 DMs. So oh, it's yeah. going to take me like the whole day to clean them up. So I just like, okay, you know, screw it. Yeah. Because like I, 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 uh, I've had like my DMs open for uh, for quite a while, you know, when I was starting Janus Robots and I got so mo- like many spams and stuff like that. So like right now, even like every day I wake up, right now my DMs are closed. But uh, like every time I wake up, I spend like 30 minutes or even one hour of my day trying to, you know, figure out the DMs. 
Uh, so yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, and I honestly don't even feel like there's there whatever. We're going on a rant on Discord, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just feel like in the settings of it, it should be easier to control like who can message you and who has you know like that you have to. It should be that you have to accept somebody as a friend, but sometimes it's like they're I don't know the settings yeah, are yeah. a disaster <laughs> with it. They just need to clean that shit up. So Discord, if you're listening to this, fix your shit uh, because everybody bitches about the the amount of bots and stuff on there. But please don't ban us from. <laughs> from yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, that's, that's Mark's opinion. <laughs> <laughs> not for financial advice yeah. <laughs> yeah no 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 it's uh it, hey it serves its purpose everything like that but we can all use a little constructive criticism and that's our constructive well that's my that's my i'll say my, that's my opinion on discord clean the clean the bots up i'm tired yeah. of being told i've won whitelist for a project that i didn't win whitelist to and they're just trying to fish me but you're a great platform thank you discord <laughs> <laughs> yeah discord's banning me immediately after this but um so I want to talk about real quick before we get into dust and, and get into the whitelist and everything like that, because I know that was obviously a, a hot subject on Twitter. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the kind of the bear market that we're in right now. So um, mm -hmm. if you're open to discussing kind of what you guys did to, to protect your uh, project, because obviously, you know, when you guys minted, the, the price of soul was obviously much higher than what it is right now. So did you guys take any sort of protective measures to make sure that you would be able to have the funds to properly run your project uh, in, mm -hmm. during a time like this? Yeah, of course, so we diversified in two ways. So the first way is that we converted, you know, all the Solana to USDC, not all the Solana, but 75 to 80% of Solana to USDC when Sol was at like 70 slash 75 so yeah, we kind of realized that, you know, the market is going down and, you know, the sole at 25 is a very likely thing to happen. So yeah, that's something that we did. But besides, like for like about 10% of our treasury, we have bought like different blue chip NFT projects, like the D-Gods, the Ty Robotics, the like Stone Apes. So yeah, I think that that was also kind of a good thing to do. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting to see what each project does to make sure that they have the funds to operate their business yeah. and everything and like that. And, um, you know, it's a uh, it's a very interesting time. I, mm -hmm. I talked about it with um, a few different projects in the last few weeks of like making sure that you have the funds to run your business, because yeah. realistically, like you, you never know what's going to happen with the market, but you've got to be able to protect your ass. And if, if you the funny part is, if you had told somebody during the uh, the 250 soul, right, if, if you had said at that point, if you came out and you said, uh, we saw sold 90% of our, our treasury into uh, USDC yeah. to protect ourselves in case there's a downturn in the price of Solana, you would have been fudded to death. You would have had so many people like, this project is shit, they don't believe in soul, yada, yada, yada. But yet, you know, as a technical trader, that like, you can sometimes look at like charts and things like that and kind of see, hey, it's likely that this is going to occur. Doesn't mean it's always going to. But one of my buddies who's been, he's a pretty big uh, crypto whale, he's been telling me forever, hey, he's like, soul's going to $20. And he's like, it'll come back up at some point, but it's going to $20. Yeah. Like, don't, and so he sends, the, there's a meme of, uh, I think it's Donald Trump saying zero. Like, and he just, <laughs> sends that all the time it's going to zero and uh and then lo and behold like he he nailed the call right and obviously no no calls are 100 percent correct but the thing is like you have to protect your project and it is interesting to think about how fudded that would have been a little bit ago if you came out and said like we sold at 250 yeah. and and sold it into usdc to protect ourselves people would have been mad about that and now people love it just crazy how the market changes that's once again the psychology of people so uh you know they're greedy when once again like the solana was on the all-time high and they they kind of expected it to go you know up and up and up so once again when when we had like the like generous and space robots mint the solana was like 120 or something like that and I had like zero intentions of selling soul once again, because like of, of the psychology, I thought that, okay, you know, it's like two times less than the all time high. So we have like this possibility of like uh, increasing our like Dow treasury is going to be great. But essentially, you know, you have to be as diversified, you know, you have to be as composed as possible. And yeah, it just makes sense because like we get all the royalties in soul, we get like all the potential profits, you know, in Solana as well but we pay our salary in, in USDC. We have like about 20 to 30 employees, like, you know, including alpha hunters, different, different like uh, whitelist hunters. So that's essentially one of the reasons why we, you know, decided to do that. And these people, like, it's not only like some 20 year old gents and stuff like that. that that's like people with families that have to like pay their mortgages. They, they have to like feed their kids. So yeah, that's, that, that was a no brainer. 
Yeah, yeah, no, that makes complete sense. So go into the be- uh, the the rationale as to why when you guys decided to come out with Generous Robots, you came out with a collection size of what was it, five thousand five hundred fifty five. Yeah, and then you guys eventually came out with the Space Robot. So kind of go into the the logic behind those two th- decisions. Yeah, absolutely. So we wanted to kind of once again increase our community by doing the Space Robots Mint, but at the same time we kind of also realized that you know. The majority of the mean sales from the generous robots went to the ideas. So we bought the launchpad tokens. And we kind of started to see that, you know, they're dipping a little bit. And we realized, okay, guys, we need to diversify and we need to build like other potential utilities. So we kind of realized that, okay, you know, by doing this Gen 2, we kind of, you know, killing two goals, uh, you know. And uh, the first goal, once again, was to like increase our community and to like attract all the new members and to maybe reward our community as well by kind of you know making the space robot collection and we actually actually like divided it by two parts so the first part was breeding so like if you had like two generous robots and if you had like enough gear you would be would have been able to like get the space robot uh, but at the same time we wanted like to make this collection a bit exclusive so that's why like our mint price was a little bit on the higher end and yeah so that was the main idea and we also wanted like to roll out a really like huge vc fund like I know that Monkey Dow right now has the, like the VC fund, but there is like a lot of expenditures, you know, in order to roll this out. Because first of all, you need to like consult with the legal department, and like you, you need to have like you, you need to hire a really uh, like credited uh, lawyer in order to you know build it. Because you have to like establish different offshore foundations, stuff like that. Not because it's illegal, but because you know there are like multiple uh, regulations. Uh, so yeah. And after that, you know, you basically need to create the whole new ideal launchpad after that. You know, you, you need to kind of automate the, you know, token, uh, like, withdrawals. You need to automate, like, all the projects uh, rolling in there. So, yeah, that was the main goal of the, all the space robots as well. Yeah, and once again, the launchpad, you know, being able to kind of hire more developers and, you know, hire a better marketing team. So when you guys go into making these decisions, you talked about having obviously a, a large team and things like that. How do you guys uh, position yourself in, in terms of like, obviously, you know, kind of in this space, people expect you to do something and then have something else ready to go and then have something else that you're working on and then something else you're working <laughs> on. So how do you guys kind of um, go into uh, delegating like who's doing what and what you're working on? And do you guys have a, a way that you go about creating uh, ideas and brainstorming and things like that? Yeah, that's actually, you know, a great question. The scalability, I guess, is like the biggest problem of ours because like I've like we've never run the business so big. And once again, like all the kind of fund founders, they are very young. So it's like uh, a very complicated to navigate in this space. But, you know, we obviously try to create like this organization chart where, you know, we have like the main team like me and Priber. So we're, we're actually like responsible for everything and we need to kind of, you know, monitor and navigate everything. But at the same time, we have like a CTO. So like he's responsible for, you know, all the technical updates, you know, wh- that we've like come up with. We have like a COO, so operations, uh, operations manager. So he's responsible for, you know, keeping the current things running. And uh, basically f- like from that, like we have like the, you know, uh, person like with responsibility. So they, ha- they have like one area of, of responsibility. So like the technical part. So he needs like to make sure that, you know, all the technical stuff like is kind of uh, all set and, you know, that it's working properly. And uh, basically how, for example, we hire right now. So we also like, uh, we, we try to have like this personal kind of touch and personal approach. So like me and Priber, we, we always try to, you know, have these calls with new people. But at the same time, for example, if we're hiring like mods or alpha hunters, we don't need to like spend our time too much on them because, you know, they they kind of, you know, come in and they, and come out. So, yeah, this scalability is like a major, you know, kind of problem for the NFT and j- just like to kind of grow your business. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's definitely something with all of this is that the majority of people have never run businesses this large. And it's such a and it's such an interesting business. Like it's not one once again where there's like, you know, 50 years of history of running a business like this. It's like this is all brand new and everybody's learning on the fly and everything like that. And so I always think it's really interesting to kind of get into the minds of like how certain decisions are made. and, And like, you know, does a team have like a, you know, a way of brainstorming like is there a certain like creative process that you guys have and things like yeah. that so uh, by the way as for the brain yeah. brainstorming so uh we have basically like two two things so first thing we usually you know have calls with priber so he's like in a different kind of country right now he's in turkey and you know we kind of tried to chat and you know 
create something unique or different. But at the same time, we always try to incentivize our staff uh, so that they would be able to, you know, come up with something new. And we have like some uh, creative bonuses for them. So for example, we've recently like put out a challenge for our staff. If they can c- come up like with a great idea for a like potential pro- product that we can launch, they, we will be like giving them $1,000. Know, so I think that that's great to incentivize your, your like team in that way. But at the same time, like uh, in regards to like our team and how, you know, we reward our team. So uh, it's great like to pay, you know, them stable salary, you know, in USDC, but at the same time we need to motivate them and they need to, we need to like actually make sure that they care about the project. And that's why we also pay them like percentage from the royalties. So yeah, uh, like basically like, different, you know, CTOs, COs, they have like different percentage from the royalties. And, you know, this way we are making sure that they're not like doing this as, you know, they're like nine to five job that they actually, you know, feel uh, like, like a co-owner of the project. I think we'll start to see more people in, in the future start to uh, give bonuses to their community too if they come up with an idea. Because yep. I think it's sometimes when you're, Anytime you're running any business, you're always a little bit clouded by the fact that like you are the founder of that business and you're running it and everything like that. And I think sometimes somebody who is on the outside who can look at it from a fresh perspective can go, hey, what about this? And and maybe that's an idea that you had thought about before, but never really put like that much energy into or whatever. Or maybe it's a completely new idea that you've never heard before, but it's like at the end of the day, getting the best ideas possible is what the goal is. And I think the, once again, it goes back to if you create that great relationship between, um, you know, your your founding team and everybody who's working with you guys and then your holders, then I think you're just more likely to generate that next idea that takes you guys to the fucking moon. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and that's always been something that's it's interested in me is just like how teams, um, you know, gauge their holders uh, ideas too, because there's always going to be something that, and I could go back through and, and look at probably like D-Gods and up with something that Frank has implemented that, that, that the community kind of came up with to begin with. Uh, but there's there's so many different things that over time, if you just listen to your holders and, and um, you know, there's obviously there's always going to be some ideas where you're like, that, that idea is not, not it. <laughs> yeah. But if there's that one idea that takes you to the moon, it could be that thing. And so maybe it's some sort of like bounty down the road, like come up with the right idea. You guys get X, Y, Z, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I think I think we had these challenges, but the problem essentially is that sometimes, like our community sees, you know, some success, successful projects like launching their own products. For example, I know like the DCF, the like Digit Coin Flip, right? Mm-hmm. They have like this game, and uh, there there are there are also like some projects with casinos and stuff like that. So essentially, that's also illegal in some way because you're advertising gam- gambling and betting, and they see like this, uh, like our community sometimes sees that. Okay, like these projects, they have like a steady cash flow, but once again, how sustainable is that? Right. So like, w- w- what w- w- what we're gonna do with that? So essentially, and like, w- uh, they sometimes like our community thinks that that if we implement something similar, that it's gonna blow, and that you know we, we will still be like on the same level in terms of the competition to them. So that's why you need to kind of explain your community some potential risks and maybe like regulations that might take place and that, you know, uh, explain them the reasoning behind why you are not taking this decision and why you decide not to implement this product. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think it's also too, not just like going and just looking at like, you know, one project and being like, okay, D gods did this. We should for sure do that. Or stoned yeah. apes did this. We should for sure do that. Or Tayo did this or whatever. It's like, also we got to be creative, right? We got to come up with that idea that somebody else isn't doing so that we're not like that way. We've got first mover advantage, right? Um, otherwise, if you're copying what somebody else is doing, yes, you might get some sort of benefit, but you're never going to get as much of a benefit as the project who did it first. Right. Yeah. So it's uh, you know, it's like, be creative and things like that, but we have to come up with ideas more than just like what somebody else has already done. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's great to take like an existing idea and to improve it, right? Yeah, if you yeah, yeah if you can improve it for sure. If you've got some, hey. I saw this project's doing this. I think it'd be really cool if we did this. That's like a level ahead of that. But if somebody's like, we should just do exactly what they did. Yeah. It's like, well, okay. <laughs> You're basically like removing, uh, removing like the whole concept of the NFTs that, you know, you like the NFTs is a space for the creative people. I like it because like you can basically like realize your creative potential. But, you know, if you are just copying other projects, uh, I don't like it. Yeah. 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 You got to get creative in your own right. So, okay. So then talking about leading from the forefront, you guys decided to do that with the whitelist and, and the duppies and everything like that. And so what went into the decision of deciding to buy, I believe if we're, uh, 
up until this point, 21,535 dust, uh, which I believe you guys are in second place by three three dust. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I three dust. So if anybody yeah. in your Dow right now is buying three dust, throw that out there because you it, it unfortunately it had to be me because like I got you know the wallet from which we <laughs> need to buy it. So yeah, like when we had like this announcement that Gcan is also like buying it and that they actually like kind of were on the, on the first place. You know, I tried to play around with them for like one or two hours, but then I realized, come on guys, like it's time right. consuming. Like we're not like 15 year old guys that I try and, you know, to outpace each other. You know, it's, it was great for the in initial marketing, but in the end of the day, like we have, you know, 100 other things to do. So yeah, but uh, why uh, once again, we decided to do that. So uh, first of all, it's a great exposure for us. So, you know, once again, like Frank, you know, made the tweets, the Digots also like made some retweets about us. And, you know, it's great for us to like have, you know, once again, our brand kind of uh, more exposed and, you know, have more eyes on it. But at the same time, uh, it makes perfect financial sense. So uh, once again, let's say, you know, we've like uh, spent about 60K, you know, on this like uh, whitelist spots, there's going to be like about 150 whitelist spots. So if we can uh, essentially, you know, raffle or auction or, you know, make a leaderboard and if we can like basically, you know, sell, uh, one whitelist spot for about like 150 bucks, then uh, not 150, I'm sorry, for, for 400 bucks, then, you know, we will break even. And uh, I, I do think, you know, that the whitelist spots for this hyped mean that uh, means they, you know, are going for a very high price. So uh, especially on the OTC markets, I know like the tripping apes or the OK bears. So uh, in that like terms, it's, it was a no brainer. But once again, we want to burn our own native token. So uh, essentially, we had like two options. Should we just like spend 60K USDC in order to burn our own token? But why should we do that? You know, our, like some of our holders will be, you know, still selling the token. We won't get the exposure. We won't get maybe some like consulting services from the DGATs. And uh, that's why we had like this multiplier effects, you know, when we invi uh, kind of invested in, in Dust that, you know, we kind of ha uh, had like this breach to Frank. We were able like to ask him some questions about like our marketing strategy and like, hey, what should we do with this or the with that? So essentially, I think that that's, you know, beneficial for us and for them as well. Because like this way, they are <laughs> improving, you know, their whitelist logistics because they don't have to like allocate the whitelist to one like individual holder. They are basically like uh, asking us to do that. So yeah, that's like a win-win for, for both of us. Yeah, and I think with it too, you have to take risks at times, right? Like what, doing what you did was a risk, right? Because yeah. there's always people who are going to be like, I don't think that was the greatest use of Dow funds, yada, yada, yada. But at the end of the day, like you have to take those risks and you hope that those pay off. And maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But at the end of the day, you're going to learn from the experience. But if you're afraid to take risks, then you're never going to benefit your holders because you have to be willing to take yeah. risks. And all of the people that have succeeded in the NFT space have taken risks. So it's like, yeah, there's, there's, I understand there's an argument as to like why you shouldn't do what you guys did. But I also understand the argument for it. And I actually think the thread that you put out there, which I'll link in the description of this video, so if anybody hasn't read it, they can read it. Mm -hmm. But uh, so let's make sure I do that. Let's remind <laughs> each other. Uh, but the um, but you know I think when you when you read that thread, you understand why you guys did that. And yes, it's a risk. But once again, everything in this, every decision you make in this is a risk. Yeah. But your your job and your goal is to give back to your holders, and this is the idea that made the most sense. Like also one kind of analogy that we have, most of the DAOs, I think that like one hundred percent of the DAOs buy NFTs with their treasury, right? So NFT is actually an asset. But at the same time, the whitelist also is an asset. Yeah. So it's kind of an option to buy, you know, an NFT later on in the future. And it also like, has some price in there. So if we like can buy the whitelist for, you know, probably, the, arguably the most hype mean on Solana, why should we not do that? All so right. yeah, that's like completely makes sense. Yeah, and we'll just, I'll use D guys as an example again, because once again, I think a lot of people are aware of the, the moves they make, but when Frank and the D guys, you know, uh, purchased the team in the big three, um, yeah. there were a lot of people who didn't understand that, and they were like, I don't get why, blah, 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 blah. Fast forward a few months, and now people see the other projects that have gone and, and purchased the team in the big three, and they see, you know, uh, D-Gods earlier today was on CBS, and it's like, mm -hmm. that's legit. Like, that's really, really cool. And so the initial FUD, and then as people start to understand it, and they see, okay, this is cool, um, that's where you have to, as a project founder, you have to make that decision that you feel like is the, is the best thing for the project. You listen to your holders, you listen to your DAO, you listen to the rest of the team, but at the end of the day, you got to do what you got to do, and you hope it pans out, but regardless... 
you learn from whatever you're doing. And yeah. it's not like it's not like you were saying we're putting all of our eggs into this basket. <laughs> and if this doesn't work, we're fucked. <laughs> yeah. It's like no, you were you were using your funds to do make a smart decision, uh, a decision that you know I I believe will be the right decision. And I think a decision that does you can't put a price on marketing. And th- the name Generous Robots has been talked about so much more in the last week than it was yeah. in, the, in the few weeks before that. And so it's like that alone, it's hard to put a price on that. But there's no doubt that that benefits you. And then I I don't want to get into the specifics of your phone call with Frank, because I know a lot of that is private. Uh, but, uh, you know, were you happy with the with how the first uh, initial call went with Frank? Uh, I mean, just to make it clear, so <laughs> it was actually a funny thing. So uh, the call was not kind of dedicated to the, like, advisor and help. So we had to, like, send, you know, the funds yeah. to, to their wallet. And, like, Frank DM'd us and was like, okay, guys, can you please, like, send the money? And he sounded, like, so suspicious that I'm like, okay, you sound like a scammer. Because, like, the, 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 there are, like, so many fake accounts of Frank. Right. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, okay, so can you please, like, add me, you know, to, to friends on Discord? And he was like, okay, sure. And I'm like, I, I really frank? And he was like, yeah, yeah, I'm sure I'm, I'm really frank. So, yeah, that was, like, the main goal of the phone call. But, yeah, th- then we had, like, a small chat, and I've asked him, you know, about our, like, big marketing move that, you know, we're taking on right now. I can touch on that right now. So... Uh, essentially, that's kind of similar move as the DGUTs did with the big free. But like we have an option to become like a sponsor, a kit uh, like sponsor for one of the, you know, not top soccer clubs in the UK, but it's a pretty well known club with like a great history. And uh, although I kind of understand that, you know, the US like guys, they don't, they have like nothing <laughs> information about the soccer, they don't nothing about the soccer, but. I realized that like soccer is the most popular sport in the world and uh, like it's it might be a great you know IRL utility for our holders it might help you know us to like like it it might help to put us to the next level because like our basically NFTs will be more mass adopted so to say and you know that people will actually like see like robots DAO on the logo of you know of a soccer of, of a soccer club so yeah I think that that's kind of the thing I asked Frank and yeah so once again we're like closing this this deal and yeah hopefully you know we will we'll announce it soon well there we go and so will it be the logo that's on the top of your hat uh yeah robots DAO so essentially like we uh once again we're generous robots but at the same time we kind of realized that if we have this logo on the kit it's going to be a little bit long and like people you know who see uh, like this game on the television they won't be able to like you know uh, read it out and it will look like too small so that's why we decided to you know kind of rebrand a little bit and have like the robots DAO. but at the same time we have like this robot right like uh the same that you have like on your shirt yeah and uh basically like this robot looks like he symbolizes the, the word generous so we're not kind of shifting from our main idea yeah yeah, and I gotta say, by the way, the merch is comfy as hell. Yeah, yeah this is this is good. great. Big fan, big fan. Uh, I'm gonna need one of those sweatshirts too, by the way, because I'm a big <laughs> sweatshirt guy, and that looks comfy as shit. Like I'm looking at you rocking it right now. I'm like, I kind of need that. Um, I'm not a huge hat guy. I never wear hats. They just don't fit my head. I don't look right with them. But the hat looks fresh too. Uh, but the shirt. Real comfy. I would actually wear this. Like that says, yeah. and that and that's actually something that I think is really important when it comes to merch. Is like, I don't want to rock your merch just because like I fuck with you guys as yeah, people. Yeah. I want to rock it because it's comfy as shit. Like I want to rock it because I actually want to wear it. Mm-hmm. And and that's something that I think, uh, you know, some projects have done a really good job with their merch. Yeah. I think some have done a decent job. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's like you want people to actually want to rock that. And then it's the easiest way to onboard other people when somebody else goes, "Hey, what is that shirt you're rocking?" Or what is that? you know if if what you're wearing looks cool to somebody who's not just in nfts it's an easy way to start a conversation mm-hmm. about nfts and why they should get into it and then obviously they're going to want to get into that project because they like the the, the apparel yeah. you're rocking so the merch is just like a completely different topic that i kind of wanted to discuss so we've like kind of were in discussions with three companies that were doing merch for us and like one of them you know we had like those samples those hoodies and i tried them on and i realized that the quality of them was a little bit poor so I don't want to like completely shit on them, but like I kind of realize that okay, like our holders won't be satisfied with this quality because like I myself I won't be wearing these hoodies, and the delivery like took forever. So that's also you know one important thing to do. 
Then, like the second company, so we kind of realized that we were not able to build like some long-term uh, partnership with them because like they were not, you know, willing to like help us with something. So that's why we kind of decided to like switch from them as well. So the uh, <laughs> the, the T-shirt that you have right now is the third company, there and we I think go. that yeah, third time's the charm. Yeah, they will be, we will be working with them. So the main idea, once again, to have like the best product and to actually like make people, you know, wear our merch. We don't want to like roll out the merch for the sake of, you know, additional utility or stuff like that. We actually want to kind of polish it to make the best products once again. So yeah, that's that, that's what we're trying to do. And yeah, the whole like merch is also uh, a very complicated process in terms of, you know, automating it. Because right now, what all the collections basically are doing is that they have a limited drops. I don't know if you know like this company, Anti-Social Social Club. Do you yeah, know yeah, this yep. guy? So yeah, so essentially they have like these limited drops and it's much more uh, convenient because this way, uh, essentially you can like sell out within, I know, like two or three days, right? And then you you can like uh, upload all of the like uh, payment data, all of the like sell, uh, I mean buyers data into one Excel table. You know you can load it into some websites and automate the delivery process. But if you have a continuous uh, you know uh, process of buying, then it's going to be complicated because this way you will have to manufacture it like each and every time, you know, on a case by case basis. And I know that like the vendor we're working you know with right now, he's trying to kind of uh, create new solutions and automate this process. So yeah, we're, we're excited for that. So like our you know initial goal for the merch would be to have like some limited drops as well, but then we kind of want to have like this thing ongoing, and you know holders will be able to buy like our teas you know at any given moment of time. So has anybody been able to buy this yet or not no, yet? Not yet. We still have not like roll, oh, rolled so out. Oh, this shit yeah, is yeah, limited yeah. It's, edition. It's, it's exclusive. Okay, so, okay. So I actually had no idea about the quality, so I was like a little bit nervous that, you know, you you, you would not like the smell of it or stuff like that. No, but no. It, it, it looks good on you, yeah. And it smells great. It smells yeah. great. And uh, by the way, if anybody wants to DM me a thousand souls, it's yours right now. I'll have it shipped <laughs> out to you next week. No, just kidding. Uh, but no, no, it really is great. Now, I, pr yeah. trust me, I would not, I would tell you privately that this is trash if it was trash. It is not trash. It is great. Um, the quality of it's great. And I'm a big, um, like I like a shirt that's really comfy and I don't like, sometimes when you rock a t-shirt, they're like super boxy. And so the <laughs> sleeve is like, like that. And yeah. my arm is just swimming yeah. in there and, and I hate that shit. So I like that it hugs you a little bit more. Your but biceps it, look, bigger, you know, yeah, yeah the biceps <laughs> look massive. Um, but, uh, no, it, yeah, it gives you biceps just yeah. by putting on the shirt. So, uh, I want to thank you for that, but, no uh, but no, no, this is, it's good stuff. And, and, um, yeah, I know the logistics of, of, uh, doing merch drops yeah. and everything like that is not fun, especially because everybody lives all across the entire world. So, uh, not an easy thing to pull off. I think people have to remind themselves of that sometimes. Yeah. So kind of to touch on the merch, so I think that within the next like two or three weeks, we will be rolling out like this whole merch platform. But besides like being able to buy like only, you know, the clothes or the apparel, we want to sell some like IRL, you know, physical products that will actually be helpful. So essentially right now we have like an accelerator, you know, project and accelerator client. Uh, it's like the Pickleball Apes. So these guys, they're building like a pickleball brand, but it's not like the brand brand, you know, that we got used to that. Okay, I have no projects, I have no products, but you know, we have brand. They actually have like, they're manufacturing the pickleball pedals. So are you familiar with the pickleball? Yeah, one yeah. of my best friends, like a diehard pickleball uh, player. Yeah, that's great. So we also plan to sell like those pedals on our, you know, platform. And yeah, this is going to be huge. Uh, we also have like the NFT prints. So like that's, you know, like an NFT art on a, uh, like a big, uh, I don't know, like, how to say it, on a big... Uh, like canvas? Yeah, on, on, a, on a big canvas, exactly. So, yeah, essentially, like, we will be selling it as well. And, yeah, we, we try to, like, uh, kind of connect the IRL world and the NFT world as well. So that's kind of what I think the NFT space is lacking at the moment. And I think that's why we want to go, like, with this deal with the so soccer club. And we also have, like, this, like, ongoing kind of discussion about the partnership with, you know, one company. So the name of the company is Satoshi Index, and these guys, they're creating their own trading bot. So the trading bot is based on the DCA strategies. It's a dollar cost average strategy. I don't know if you heard about it. So yeah. essentially, yeah, it's when you like have a recurring payment. So when you buy, you know, some assets in, in like different times, like from time to time, like every week, let's say. And we basically trying to allow our holders to, you know, buy the subscription for this bot with gear. So yeah, hopefully, you know, was, this will also be rolled out, you know, in the near future. So yeah, we will see how it goes. There we go. There yeah. we go. What, what else can your holders expect? Is there any alpha that you want to drop in terms of yeah. uh, what else they can expect coming up soon? 
All right, real quick, I got to interrupt this episode of the podcast to tell you guys about a new sponsor. Now, before you call me a sellout, I promise you I'm not doing that. I'm not ruining the integrity of the show. I'm not just accepting any sponsorship opportunity. I'm not doing that. I actually reached out to this company, and this company is called Hey Wallet. And I reached out to them because somebody had actually used Hey Wallet to send me Solana. And so when they did that, I was like, what is Hey Wallet? I don't, I'm not familiar with them. How does this work? Everything like that. Basically, Hey Wallet is a way that you can send somebody cryptocurrency without knowing their wallet address. All you have to know is their Twitter username. So for example, if you're watching this podcast and you're like, oh my God, this is the most amazing podcast I've ever seen. I want to send Mark a thousand Solana. What you would do is you would create an account on Hey Wallet. You would load it just like any other wallet. And then you would tweet, Hey Wallet, send Mark Colser a thousand Solana. And boom, I get a thousand Solana. And so Immediately, there's a transaction on Twitter, that, which you get to see, and then there's also a receipt for that, and it goes up right on SoulScan. So you can basically see everything with the whole transaction right then and there, and that's one of the coolest parts about Hey Wallet is that there's the social element to cryptocurrency, and that's what I thought was really, really cool about it because... Twitter is such an important thing for uh, the Solana space. And one of the big things I talk about all the time is onboarding people into the space. And so what easier way to do that but then by saying to somebody, hey, get onto Twitter, I'm gonna send you Solana through Hey Wallet, and boom, now you're ready to go. You're ready to buy NFTs, you're ready to do this, you're ready to do that. And actually, one of the new features of Hey Wallet is that you can actually send NFTs back and forth through Hey Wallet. So it's just a really easy way to transact, and it's an easy way to send somebody Solana without having to ask them for their wallet address or anything like that. So if you wanna show appreciation to somebody, like I said, hey, if you're watching this podcast, you're like, this is the most amazing podcast ever, and you wanna send me Solana, all you gotta do is go Hey Wallet, send Mark Holser a thousand Solana, and bang. I'll, I'll retweet that. I'll quote tweet that. I'll do the whole nine. So that, that's uh, the new sponsor of the podcast. So I want you guys to show some love to Hey Wallet. We're going to be doing some really cool giveaways, doing some really cool contests and things like that, because I'm all about onboarding new people into the space, about giving back to people in the space. And that's what I talked about with Hey Wallet. And that's why I agreed to work with them is because they're all about that too. And so, yeah, that's why I brought Hey Wallet into the podcast and I'm looking forward to working with them. And now back to the episode. So, uh, that's basically right now within the next like two or three weeks, two or three weeks they will be there will be a, like generous robots art upgrades and uh, you know we kind of understand that right now our art is not on this that level to get you know the nft community like to basically buy ape into our project just because of the art and that's something that we're trying to kind of solve i can show it to you if you oh if hell you yeah. yeah yeah and actually, by the way, guys, this is no bullshit. I, he was going to show it to me earlier, and I was like, no, no, no. Show it to me on the podcast so I can give an actual reaction because I was like, I can't fake a reaction. Like if, you know, so if it's trash, I'm going to have to be like, oh, my God, this is awful. <laughs> yeah, and we actually, like, reached out to uh, to the scam. So, like, that's the artist behind the, you know, Dead Guts. Yeah. So, yeah, and uh, so we try to, like, get his, you know, sense of the art. So mm -hmm. we're trying to kind of get his, you know, consulting services and his opinion, you know, about the art. So it will be, like, as perfect as, as possible. So, yeah, let me just connect to the Wi-Fi. There we go. Yeah. And then, by the way, is this going to be, while you're, while you're pulling this up, is this going to be something that people then upgrade with gear? Yeah. So essentially, we also have the reactor airdrop to our, like, generous robots holders. And uh, basically, there are three different, like tiers of the reactors so and uh, if you have like the most rare tier you'll have the highest discount so you won't need that much of gear, of gear to upgrade and you know you upgrade the robot you know uh, like it will yield more gear so besides like the you know art upgrade we will have the stake and rewards upgrade as well very cool so yeah let me show you the the art upgrade all right let's see this so Oh, I like that a lot. Yeah. The, oh, I like that a lot. There is like an NFT before and an NFT after. So yeah, you can compare them. Yeah, that's very cool. That's very cool. Can I can I describe it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think everything is just way more detailed. I mean, like yeah, way, exactly. way more detailed. Uh, the There's just way, like I want to zoom into all of these, but I'm not because I don't want to mess anything up. But the, um, yeah, it's way more detailed. There's just, there's more uh, like life to them. And uh, more way. I mean, just I really can't emphasize the the detail enough. Oh, Discord's now reloading, but um, oh, the Wi-Fi went out again. I don't know what's <laughs> going on, but no, the um, the detail on that is is way better, and I feel like there's um, they feel more lifelike. And yeah. So yeah, no, I'm definitely a big big fan of that, and so so that's rolling out for the generous robots, right? Yeah, for the generous robots. And, and then is there going to be a similar upgrade with space robots? So. Or? So for the space robots, we already rolled out the like rarity upgrade where you can essentially upgrade, you know, the rarity rank. 
And uh, there is also like the probability of the failure for the like space robots upgrade. And we have been like inspired by this probability from the like stone apes. And uh, essentially, I think that this probability of the failure is a great thing. Once again, the people like touched on that because like when, you know, you fail, like some of the community members, they fail the upgrade, they still realize that they're contributing, you know, to the healthy ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And that's like a very important thing to say. But at the same time, we try to make it this way that if you have a common robot, you still have a, a probability of getting like a super legendary robot. So like people actually have this kind of lottery element uh, into that. But besides, once again, we like have some initial plans to animate the uh, space robots, you know, so they will be more lively. But once again, as for the art, we are mainly focusing on, you know, rewarding our OG holders, the generous robots. So yeah, it, it will be like a next level art. That's yeah. very cool. And I also kind of want, uh, so when we like deciding, you know, how to upgrade our art, we have like this dilemma. Should we kind of, uh, you know, revert our art so that it won't be left facing or right facing? And right now we have like some internal discussions about that. Like, what should we do? So on the one hand, there are much more, you know, successful collections facing right. So like the, once again, the board apes, the D-Gods and stuff like that. But at the same time, if, for example, we roll out these upgrades, our like major hidden web page will be messy because there will be like different, you know, robots, you know, facing like opposite directions. So I think that eventually, you know, we will still have them facing left. So yeah, that's uh, in order just to not make everything messy. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's fair. And I and I think you know, it's like anytime you're you're improving upon the art, it's like that also means that at some point you might change your mind and you might go, hey, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna put out an upgrade where all of them change to looking the opposite way. Yeah. And, you know, it's like at the end of the day, nothing's a finished product in this. Is that you're constantly the best projects are constantly evolving, and that's something that I think you guys are really doing. And it's it's cool to see um, kind of your growth from what you guys were initially wanting to do with the IDO, and now kind of switching over to different utilities and and then continually coming up with more and more utilities of gear yeah. and it'll be cool to watch this podcast a year from now and and kind of see where gear is gone and uh what you guys have done with it and you know is there new utilities and you know what utilities worked which ones yeah. didn't things like that it's yeah. a constant experiment you know uh, by the way like to uh, this point that we try to kind of have uh, our community you know engaged and like ask them to like create new utilities for gear so uh, one of our like uh, let's say analysts and like VC fund managers, he uh, decided to launch like a, a completely like new initiative that you know the founders and the core team we were not aware of it. So that's called the project Clink Clank. So like that's our you know catchphrase and mm -hmm. our motto. So essentially uh, the main kind of goal of the project is to connect you know the NFTs to the real world by. Uh, let's say, uh, you know, your mom or your parents, I know your friends, they own some like online store, right? And uh, let's say you can like ask them, hey mom, like if you have some promo code, you know, from Generous Robots, can we get like a 5% discount for like some physical products? Like it will be mutually beneficial like for us and for, you know, your parents or friends to, to do that. Because like this way, once again, they can generate more sales and, you know, our holders can get the discount. So right now we're like trying to like kind of build the system of the promo codes. So uh to, to be like an nft group on as well so yeah that's all something that well hey if you right want now. a discount for roast number coffee we can make that happen and we can do that for generous robots yeah let's go i mean we can also sell it like on our potential marketplace with gear and we can like match it with usdc so you know, we'll, yeah we'll discuss it yeah. yeah let's definitely discuss that so um outside of that is there anything that you would like to talk about that we haven't talked about yet i know we've uh, we've gone over mm -hmm. a lot and i'm excited for uh, what's coming up with generous robots is there anything else you'd like to talk about yeah, so I think that's uh, one of the things we're also working on right now is some cross-chain initiatives. And, you know, the future is cross-chain, as like multiple people are saying it. But the point is that right now we have like a launchpad client and like the, this is the team like of really like top artists, top professionals. So they've worked like with, I know, like Lady Gaga, Travis Scott and stuff like that. And they kind of, you know, we had like a, a mutual friend and they decided to re reach out to us saying like, okay, guys, I want to launch this NFT project. Like, how can we help us? And uh, essentially right now, we're trying to once again partner up with the Cross Mint for a potential mint like of this collection. Uh, it's, it, it's planned to be an Ethereum collection, but like some of the supply will be minted in Solana as well. So this w the way they can onboard like the, you know, community from two different blockchains and they can attract li liquidity, you know, from multiple blockchains. So yeah, that's something that we're working on right now. And obviously, you know, our holders will also get some benefits from that. Maybe like whitelist spots or like percentage of the supply will be minted in gear. 
So yeah, I will. Uh, I wanted to show you the art of this project, but yeah, right now I can't because of the Wi-Fi. But yeah, is it? Would it load on your phone? Uh, yeah, I think so. Can I please have it? Yeah. There, there we go. There we go. We're coming up with solutions here. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Let's see this. Let's see this. Yeah. Just swipe it right. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, that's the freezy art. Oh wow. Like that, like yellowish uh, one. As well. Let wow. me show you the trailer as well. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Go for it. So like it's 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 really like high quality, you know, team. And this like these guys, they took about like three months to build the website. So oh, wow. the website will be uh, I don't have you heard about Star Atlas? So uh, th that's that's like a very popular NFT project. Uh like they're essentially like building the game and the metaverse. And like their website is, you know, is complicated as hell. So yeah, I just wanted to give you this video. Yeah. Just hold on a second. Is that an Ethereum project you were talking about, by the way? Uh, Star Atlas? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I was going to say, I was like, how, do, how is it a soul project I've never <laughs> heard of? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, let me just try to find it. Yeah, it's always cool to see what people are building and, and you know, where they think things are going. And I definitely think cross-chain is going to be a very, very important thing so as time goes on. That's the trailer to this project. And I'm not sure if it's, like, finished completely, so some of the scenes might not be colored, but yeah. So there is like a, uh, like the team hired a, a separate sound designer for that, that like did some, you know, sound design wow. for the San Francisco Motors show. And like, yeah. Oh, that looks, that looks cool. It's though. like a great storytelling project. And yeah, we're kind of excited for that as well. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the sort of shit that I get really excited about is like really, really well done stuff. Like this yeah. is something where I don't care if you're in the NFT space or not. Like this is, this is sick. And that's actually one of my... One of my big, um, I think, gripes with the gaming side of things is that, like, and I was talking about this on the podcast with Juice from Remnants, is that I was saying when, when we first started talking about, like, the whole gaming side of things and everything like that, people would put something out and they would be like, this is sick. And I'm like, are, are we lying to ourselves? It looks like <laughs> shit. Like, that yeah. literally looks awful. And then I'm like, why are we... Why are we lying to ourselves and acting like that's cool? It's not. So let's let's be honest and, and give credit when something is really, really well done. What you showed me today, those art upgrades, that video, the the um, crossover kind of mint there and everything, that is all incredible art. Like that's not just something where I'm saying that to like make you feel good. It's like that is if I saw that, I would, I would send that to somebody and be like, that looks fucking sick. And that's the sort of thing I think we need to give more... Um, more uh, kudos to sometimes because yeah. I think sometimes we just give kudos for like literally doing anything and <laughs> and now it does seem like the barrier to entry is a little bit higher and things That's like true. that like yeah. when I look at like the the uh, remnants game and I've been playing it the last uh, last few or last like week or so after Juice sent me over one of the uh, remnants it's really cool it's it's really well done they did a great job with it like and it's it's actually fun and so that's something where it's like okay give kudos to that and then you know the ones where it's like okay that legitimately like that sucks it's like doesn't mean we have to go shit on those projects but like let's not go and be like that's amazing because then you're also <laughs> lying to them like let's give let's let's be honest and be open about yeah. like improving and like none of us are perfect we're always trying to improve and so that's something where it's like we don't need to just like blow smoke up people's asses we can be like hey this can improve and this is how and you know and that's how we build the space to the level that it can get to and so yeah. um yeah and essentially like that's what okay bears did to the whole solana ecosystem they have made like the barrier to entry much more competitive and much more higher because right now basically you have to have like some brand identity manager that will be able to see that you have like the uh, identical fonts you know on your website and i know like somewhere in the art that the colors are similar that like everything is connected and intertwined mm -hmm. and that's why like i love the soul guts like so much because like i really love the fact that you know they're they have like a perfect color pattern they have uh -huh. like a perfect, you know, storytelling experience. And I do think that like with this, like, for example, project of uh, our Launchpad client, they will be kind of delivering that high quality creative value. And uh, as I've told you before, uh, when we started the project, we considered, you know, our NFT utility based, like uh, the generous robots is a utility based collection. We, we don't care about like these creative things, you know, I don't have any creative background. Priber doesn't have any creative background. You should have seen him. So yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> I love you. Okay. And th the point is that uh, right now I kind of realized that uh, it's not about what it's not like even about what you actually do, you know, with the project, how you, you, you kind of connect with the aerial utility. It's more about the story, the narrative, you know, behind it, the kind of immersive experience that you will be able to, you know, put into your project. So 
yeah, that's also something that, uh, once again, we need to work at, you know, in generous robots and all the communities need to work on it. Because right now, for example, like, for, uh, like once again, why, for example, cats have shifted the paradigm as well? Because they have a clear communication method on Twitter, right? Mm-hmm. They, like, spell something wrong, you know, the cats couldn't crack, like, y- y- you know, it's something wrong. But uh, at the same time, you know, they have, like, a really great marketing with these riddles, you know, who's Pablo, like, what's that, you know, Rick and Morty references. So, yeah, I think that uh, in that sense, they entertain, you know, the holders a lot, and that's why it creates a stronger sense of the community and a stronger bond within the community. So, yeah, and, for example, for our uh, Launchpad, like, clients, we try to do, like, some cool things when they, like, uh, roll out the roadmap or stuff like that. We, like... Uh, decided to hide like some of the you know uh, words of the seed phrase from the phantom wallet so like people who would be able to like see them they you know could get access to the phantom wallet with some like funds i think that zguts also did that on their roadmap so yeah that's yeah they did and i didn't even realize that <laughs> until somebody won it yeah so like that's some like cryptic stuff that's also interesting and yeah th- th- this like riddles and stuff it, it also engages the community more and yeah it, it's a good thing to have it yeah, and, and it's all about, at the end of the day, like, if your team, like, as you guys said, you guys have, like, a technical trading background, very smart people and things like that, but you said, you know, we didn't have much of a creative background, right? Yeah. So it's like, then that's the important thing is to put the people around you that have that creative background in order to, you know, do what you're, you know, know what you know and know what you don't know and then hire the right people to, to round out your team, right? For example, myself, if I were to ever do a project, like I don't have any sort of technical background, right? Yeah. I'm not a dev. I don't, you know, Rust, would, no fucking way I would know how to operate any of that. So I would have to hire the right people around me to know about all of that. The creative aspect that's been my entire life. So that part of things comes, you know, more natural to me while the technical aspects and things like like that even when you talk about like IDOs it's like it's still some of that's still like a foreign language to me right mm-hmm. so I, I'm always a big believer in like know what you know know what you don't know and then hire the right people around you to build that out and you know take it to the next level and obviously you guys have done that yeah so is there uh before we wrap up is there any last things that you'd like to talk about any alpha you'd like to drop for your community anything you'd like to let the rest of the nft space know yeah I guess like I dropped the alpha about you know the soccer club deal yeah so yeah we're kind of excited for that about like the jar upgrades, about you know the project clink clink clank. So yeah, maybe like, like let me check my phone. Maybe like I will, you know, kind of <laughs> have one more things to, to discuss. Yeah, let's yeah. see. Are you going through like what you guys have coming up right now? Yeah, just I'm going through like my Discord DMs and yeah, <laughs> they, they floods it. Uh, so yeah, I think that uh, like also once again uh, I've touched on that. Uh, and important like alpha would be for us to partner up with this like trading. Uh, bot company because I really want so right now like uh, the best builders on Solana they're like Blo- Blocksmith Labs and Famous Fox Federation right yep so essentially th- these are the projects that have created something for the NFT ecosystem within the NFT ecosystem right so we kind of value this project but they are creating you know something for a limited number of people to use right so it's not that you know they have come up with a great idea that serves like all the, you know, Ethereum community as well, or all the, you know, like crypto community. So by kind of partnering up with this trading bot, we tried to like uh, kind of broaden and increase our utility and like increase the audience for that. So, yeah. 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 And I think that's really cool to see. And, and, you know, it's, it's anytime you can bring more utility back to your holders and then, um, you know, and then add another aspect of what generous robots is all about and everything like that. You just make the, the brand and the NFT overall, just that much more valuable. So, yeah. um, yeah, man, I mean, I'm excited for the, um, for the future of generous robots and what you guys are building. I'm excited for you guys to put out that art upgrade. I'm excited for you to announce the club sponsorship and everything like that. And, um, you know, as a, uh, you know, sports fan myself, I'm going to have to start watching and, and, <laughs> and looking for the uh, Genesis Robots logo and all of that. But, um, yeah, man, it's, I'm excited for the future. And I, once again, I appreciate you coming out here and um, I appreciate you, uh, you know, taking risks, you know, and it's it's cool to see that. And it's cool to see, um, you know, what you guys have done with the whitelist and duppies and everything like that. And I'm looking forward to seeing how that, how that all plays out, you know, and yeah. that's something that no matter what you do you're always learning you're always growing you're always evolving and that's what it takes to succeed in the nft space so looking forward to you coming back on here next time the floor <laughs> price is you know 250 and we're you know and you're killing it and now you yeah. now you're sponsoring fifa you know <laughs> I, I also kind of wanted to touch on this you know the whole bear market thing by yeah. the way as for the fifa we will be on the fifa game 
Oh, that's sick. yeah. So this club will be in FIFA, on FIFA. Oh, that yeah, that's so super you'll be dope. able to kind of see you know the robots DAO in there. There we go. So yeah, that's that's dope. But as for the, like the whole bear market, so once again, uh, we all know right now that basically the crypto market is correlated, you know, with the tech stocks, and the tech stocks are correlated with the, like S and P five hundred and stuff like that. But uh, at the same time, we understand that like the NFT market right now is also correlated with the crypto market. So like there is no not enough liquidity on the NFT market. And like essentially that's why you know the full price of like the top projects dipped. So like we have like an absolute blue chips that remain like more or less stable, but at the same time all the flow price you know of different like top projects dipped, like the token price also dipped. And it's like important once again for like the whole you know Solana community and, and, and like our community in general to understand that we can't like generate you know money out of the air and we need to have like we're correlated with the market. And it's important for you, for example, like not to sell your NFTs right now because you will be taking a loss, you know, taking into account the Solana price and like the, the token price. So it's essentially important for you to, to, to like have patience unless you absolutely like need to liquidate. Right. And to, you know, support the community because the community, uh, like the project is as strong as like the community. So yeah, I guess that's, that are my like closing thoughts and like, to kind of give you, I know, once again, not financial advice, like I did not kind of, uh, I have not done a detailed research on the market conditions, but I have read like some articles that like we expect, you know, the situation to uh, improve somewhere in the fourth quarter. So like somewhere in October or, you know, maybe November. So like expect another bull run, you know, from there. But at the same time, it's also like a great opportunity to, you know, stack up with some soul, you know, the DCA <laughs> kind of trading methods. So yeah, let's let's do that and keep supporting the projects and yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's an important thing to remind ourselves that, you know, if you believe in Seoul at 250, then you should de definitely believe at 30 <laughs> and, and, and definitely buy some more if you have the ability to, if you have the financial means to do that. Not financial advice, but you should, you know, if you have the ability, obviously, you know, go with your gut, do what you got to do. Um, and then, yeah, at the end of the day, you know, a project is going to do as well as the community allows it to do. You know, you have to really rally around each other, check in on each other during times like this, because, yeah, it's not easy to lose a shit ton mm -hmm. of money. It's not fun. Yeah. Um, and so people who have been in the crypto space for a while know that this is kind of typical and you get used to it and I'm a little numb to it at this point because it's happened so many times for me but the uh, for other people that are new to this space and everything like that it's like checking on people check yeah. in see how they're doing and stuff like that and you know it's it's cool to see a lot of people in the NFT space I do feel like are doing a really good job of that and uh and so we, yeah we gotta we gotta spread the love and and you know and and continue that sort of vibe even when things are not as euphoric as it is when you know soul is 250 and floor prices are higher and things like that um you know we'll get back to that position I have no doubt about mm -hmm that but in the meantime let's you know keep being nice to each other let's keep spreading the love and let's keep supporting good projects yeah. and good builders and and, and uh, good communities and everything like that so and uh, essentially like that's also kind of my uh you know recommendation to all the solana projects and like to all the potential minters that if you see like some project especially like right now there are like lots of you know 10k collections that you know are trying to you know basically have the same uh, meta as the OK Bears, you know, they're, they're trying to say like, OK, we're a brand and, you know, we are like building something. But uh, just like for the potential minters, guys, be cautious like of these projects. Uh, I don't want to point like anything or, yeah, yeah. or on one particular project. Like there are so, so many great projects out there, but just be cautious of those projects because some of them, they just want to suck out the liquidity of the Solana. You know, they're exchanging their mint funds into USDC and then they kind of, you know, rolling with it. And you know the the funds that they're not there. That's why like the the next mint uh, for the next mint like the liquidity is lower because people don't have like that much funds. They have already been burned, you know, with this mint. So once again, uh, I come from a finance background, and before like investing in any you know asset, you need to you know do your own research. Once again, you need to basically research the NFT project the same way you are researching the, the team, uh, the, the same way we are researching the stock. So it's like about the credibility of the team, you know, their experience and stuff like that. Then it's about the utility of the project. Then it's about the art. So like make sure to check this, like all the boxes and then you will understand, you know, if the project is worth it or not. Because right now, like all the projects they're trying to like say, okay, you know, where the next hype mint, they're buying like the Twitter, like engagers, like it's really easy to do that. Yeah. And uh, uh, that's why like uh, not sophisticated investors, they have like this idea that, okay, you know, they have like 300 followers. But, you know, out of these 300 followers, there are like, uh, I know, 250 bots, yeah. uh, K4 bots. So, yeah, you have to kind of understand it. And that's why you have to filter this out. 
And yeah, that's why I think that's uh, for the, uh, like people on Solana, they always want to have like new shiny thing, right? Uh, it's always easier like to make money you know, from the new things and from the like new means than like to keep supporting like this project and, you know, to keep kind of grinding with it. So l- let's say once again, this example of the Blocksmith Labs, right? So their floor price was like, maybe 15 or 20 Solana, like a couple of months ago, right? Mm-hmm. And then they like build this great product and, you know, it managed to, to blow. Like Mercury is like one of the best whitelist management solutions, like cross chain. Ethereum doesn't have like this this stuff. They have like this uh, premium, right? Uh, I don't know if you heard about it. So like premium essentially like a whitelist raffle system, but it's not on the same like whitelist management kind of solution that's, uh, uh, that the Blocksmith Labs have managed to build. And that's why, like, my, I guess, suggestion would be to, you know, stick to these, like, holders and, you know, builders, <laughs> uh, as people love to, love to call them. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it's important to see projects actually do shit before yeah. you just go and ape into things that have, you know, people who are not proven and things like that. So I'm a big fan of supporting projects that have uh, that have been doing it, that are succeeding, that are, you know, sticking mm-hmm. to their guns and, and showing that they can uh, survive through a bear market and that they're continually innovating and things like that. So... Um, hey, so for people who want to learn more about your project or want to talk to you directly, yeah. uh, plug your socials. Where can people find you? Sure. So, yeah, my uh, Twitter is like Mecha Godzilla slash GR. And, yeah, so we're like generous robots. And, yeah, so feel free to like to reach out to me or like to our, to our like common Twitter. And, yeah, we'll be happy to have a chat with you if you have like any ideas about the potential partnerships or stuff like that. So, yeah, we're open to that. And, you know, we're excited to collaborate with some project. And I believe, like, in this kind of synergy between two different projects, that's, you know, also why we decided to go, like, with the Dapis whitelist, because maybe, you know, we'll be able to partner up with the DGATs, like, who knows, and, you know, to have, like, some, I don't know, like, common grounds and, and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, hey, it's all about coming up with that right idea and everything yeah. like that, and collaboration is a big part of, of NFTs and the Solana network in general, and so it's uh, it's cool to see what you guys are doing. I'm looking forward to the to the future of it, looking forward to these art upgrades uh, rolling out and your sponsorships and some of these different uh, projects that you guys are working on. So Yeah, thanks uh, so much. Hey, yeah. Keep kicking ass, and I appreciate you coming on, appreciate you taking the time out of your day, and uh, appreciate everybody else watching. And uh, remember, make sure you're cutting up the podcast, uh, sharing it, uh, memeing it, whatever you want to do, creating threads, whatever and uh, we're going to be giving away some stuff and uh, so check back on Twitter we'll have all the details of that Uh, but once again man thank you for coming out Yeah. and uh, yeah appreciate all you guys thank you for tuning in thanks so much thank you for giving this me this opportunity like to express myself and to share like my thoughts about the project and like the whole Solana ecosystem on this platform and yeah once again Mark you are doing like a great thing by like popularizing this you know ecosystem and yeah no, thanks, nice man. I appreciate it. It's yeah. a, hey, it's a team effort. It's uh, it's cool to see the whole uh, soul space all coming together and everything like that. So uh, just as much as, uh, you know, you appreciate it, I appreciate it. Like you coming out here, yeah. I know it's not easy to do. And uh, and so I, I appreciate you taking the taking the chance. Taking the chance, taking the yeah. opportunity, taking the time, and and uh, yeah, looking forward to where we build this to. Yeah, and that's why I kind of don't don't like to like fund other projects. And once again, I'm very like cautious in that, especially like we, for example with some of the 10k collections, like. I don't want to fight them because, like, I understand that, like, some of them, they, uh, like, the team was really great and they they want to do, like, something meaningful. And in my opinion, like, if, if you're, like, a member of, like, a other project and if you're trying to, like, fight, you know, another project because of some jealousy or hate, that's not, like, what you want to do in order to build the ecosystem. So it's, it's just about, like, the kind of support that you guys are giving to each other. And, yeah, that's my, you know, closing note. Thank yeah. you so much, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate it. And I think everybody else will too. I mean, and it's not about creating fud or anything like that. It's just about trying to help educate people and trying to help uh, people make smart decisions in this space and things like that. And so once again, it's a space where we're all constantly learning and growing and, you know, it's an ever evolving space. So it's fun to see. It'll be interesting to see where everything goes as we come out of this bear market and whatnot. Uh, but for the meantime... Let's keep spreading the love. Let's keep, uh, you know, sharing the podcast, keep building, supporting projects. <laughs> yeah. Building and everything like that. Yeah. And, uh, let's keep it going. So yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. No problem. See you guys.